After years of boomers being able to save in tax-free savings accounts, now the millennials are starting to save money, it's time to take the tax-free out of tax-free ISAs, thus widening the wealth gap even further. Instead of being rewarded for putting money away and saving it, Instead, a new think tank is proposing and putting pressure on ministers to cap the amount that people can save in an ISA and tax them on anything above £100,000. Now, let me say first that it is a proposal, and it is just that. It's not being discussed yet. It is just a thought paper from a think tank. But this is worrying when stuff like this comes out, and it does start to trigger thoughts in the government. So let's explore this. Jeremy Hunt is thought to be lining up an attack on our pensions in March 2023 in line with the new spring budget, and an attack on ISAs would be a double blow for millennials and savers. Millions are already struggling to put away their savings, and it would just become even harder amongst all of the current issues happening in the economy. This is on top of the assault that the Chancellor took on savers when hitting both capital gains tax and dividends allowances in October 2022. The way it works currently is that you can put up to £20,000 a year across your ISAs, but you have an unlimited lifetime amount, so that can go as high as you want if you cap it every single year, which can amount to good amounts of wealth and savings. So first, let's explore a little bit about this think tank and who they are. They're known as the Resolution Foundation, who are looking into the report of putting a £100,000 limit on ISAs, of which anything above that would need to be taxed. And they've named this report ISA ISA baby. Honestly, these scripts literally write themselves. I'm not sure if it's funny or borderline insulting, but surely you cannot take this as a serious report based on its name to start with, especially with something so serious but so demeaning at the same time. One of the lead economists on this paper from the Resolution Foundation has said that ISA tax breaks primarily benefit the rich and the savings could be directed to help poorer families build savings. They also go on to say that around one and a half million savers have £100,000 or more in ISAs, while three quarters of a million families in the UK have no savings at all. This lack of financial resilience has left many exposed during the cost of living crisis, with families having to build up debts and fall behind on bills. They then go on to say that capping ISAs at £100,000 could save the government around £1 billion a year, which it could use to expand the little-used help-to-save scheme aimed at those on low incomes and who need financial support. So who and what is the Resolution Foundation and who are these economists telling us that our ISAs need to be capped? Well, when I looked up the lead economist on this, I found out that they are a 20-something-year-old early career who graduated in 2016 and has been at the Resolution Foundation for about 12 months. So based on that and the name, I wouldn't take this proposal too seriously just yet. So a little bit about the report. It highlights that the cost of living crisis has only expanded the issues we have at the moment where a lot of families in the UK are simply not saving enough money. They say that the current savings, incentives, policies and schemes that we have aren't to blame, but they also at the same time don't look at who is benefiting the most from these schemes. They also talk about how the UK as a whole is the lowest of the G7 in terms of financial resilience and savings. They also summarise that the savings rates are the lowest amongst those who also are in the lowest income brackets. Groundbreaking research, right? They also concluded in 2019 and 2020 there were approximately 27 million ISA holders in the UK, and those who earn more also save more. Go figure. So I understand their point and what they're trying to do. The big question is how do you help those on lower incomes to save more money and build greater financial resilience compared to our friends in the G7? And that's ultimately what this think tank is trying to tackle in this proposal. But unfortunately, their conclusion of taxing the rich, I think, is fundamentally flawed. Their definition of rich is the issue here and actually low and middle income earners are almost the same type of person, which I think is really confusing because the report talks about wanting to help middle earners, but at the same time is massively punishing them for saving over a lifetime. And if you're watching this thinking, yes, the government should be taxing those who have massive pots of savings over 100K, 
Let me explain to you in a bit more detail how little 100k is these days and ultimately why they're villainizing the wrong type of people. Now, ISAs aren't some kind of exotic tax avoidance scheme for the super rich and wealthy billionaires. They're meant for everyday people like me and you. There isn't a minimum contribution limit, so it doesn't lock out people who can't afford minimum contributions. You could put in 50 pence, you could put in a pound a month, and that would enable you to have a stocks and shares ISA. And of course, then you have your 20,000 pound limit every single year. So there is a maximum cap, which is a lot to some people and not a lot to others. So I did a little bit of modeling to work out how an ISA could grow. Now, if you put in 200 pounds a month into a stocks and shares ISA, and got an average return of 5% a year in the stock market, over 23 years, you would have a fund value worth more than £100,000. And many people have done just that. They've saved a little bit of money over a really long amount of time that has then amassed into a good six-figure sum that's either allowed them to retire early or reap the benefits in later life to splash out on a new car or whatever it is they want to reward themselves for for spending a lifetime saving. Or if you had got to later life and you had a good amount of equity in your home and you decided to downsize, there's a pretty good chance that you could end up with more than £100,000 in your bank account. So we're not talking about vast riches here or the incredibly wealthy in the UK. This is the average person in their 40s or 50s who has saved responsibly over a lifetime. It's effectively attacking everyday people like me and you who save and save well over a long period of time. And ultimately, we're the ones being punished by this proposal when in fact the report is set out to help the low and middle earners in this economy. The whole scheme is meant to promote saving, but in fact, it contradicts itself by punishing those who do actually save over a long period of time. It just makes no sense. But even when you do have 100K, it sounds like a lot of money and a lot of people wish they could have that. It is a life changing sum of cash, but actually when you put it into reality, imagine you're 65 years old and you live until 81, which is the current average life expectancy in the UK. That's 16 years. Now, if you divide up that 100K by the 16 years, that would only top up your pension by £6,250 a year before you run out of cash. It's hardly massive vasts of wealth or billionaire trust funds we're talking about here. Of course, that wouldn't factor in capital gains in the stock market during that time. It assumes you took out the 100k at that point, but that wouldn't change the stats too much in the grand scheme of things. Damien raised a really good point in his video that I didn't really think about, which is even those on the lowest income brackets could still fall foul of the 100 k ISA tax cap. In the report, they compare those who earn 150k every single year against those with an average salary between 20 to 30k. Those in the lower tax brackets have on average around £22,000 saved in their ISAs. And this is where those two types of people have a lot more in common than what we realise. Let's say you're 30 years old and you have that average £22,000 sat in a stocks and shares ISA. If you left that invested into the S&P 500, which based on historic factual data has gained an average annualised return of 7%, factoring in peaks and troughs and dips, by the time you are 60 years old, that pot would be worth £178,000 and that's without lifting a finger and that means you also now fall foul of the wealthy pot who are going to be taxed on their savings. Now I wanted to explore why the system is fundamentally flawed. A lot of people invest their money into stocks and shares ISAs. They're really popular and with the introduction of index funds it's really easy to get started in investing and I'm a massive fan of it. The problem is that when you have investments they can go up and they can go down and you only realize your profits after you sell your position. But if you just hold and hold and hold and never sell because you haven't materialized it or realized it, there's no tax due. My example here is let's say you put in exactly £100,000 into an ISA and it goes up 10% over a five year period, so very modest, you'd end up with £10,000 and in total 110 in the ISA pot. So if they then taxed you on that £10,000, but then all of a sudden the ISA went down and you made a loss and it went down to £90,000, does that mean that you would get the tax back? Doing it this way would be an operational nightmare. So the only way for them to actually measure this is if you sold your position in an ISA that had over £100,000 in it. But then even there, the problem still exists because you might sell one or £2,000 in a year and realise a small amount, then the market could crash and your ISA goes below the value. Does that mean you should have still paid that tax for last year when you made a profit when actually factoring in that you've made a loss this year and therefore you should technically get it back? Now let's talk about the different types of ISAs that not everyone might be aware of. 
The general trend found in the pack is that those who have greater wealth are more likely, statistically speaking, to put their money into riskier investments that yield potential higher returns. Whereas those in the lowest wealth bracket tend to keep their money in current accounts where there is no interest growing on their money. When you compare that back to those in the highest bracket, they actually have minimal money in their current accounts and instead a lot of their cash is stored away in assets and stocks and investment ISAs rather than sat as cash in the bank account. You have to remember that with inflation, if your money is in the bank not gaining any interest, it's technically going down in its value relative to inflation. If inflation is 2%, that means your money is worth 2% less over time. Even though you have the exact same amount, the cost of everything goes up so you can buy less things. Now, I don't know whether this is down to financial education, risk appetite and not wanting to lose a small amount of money that the lowest wealth bracket has, or a combination of multiple factors. But when the report explores the health to save scheme and it points out that less than 10% of eligible participants actually use the scheme, it almost proves to itself that incentivizing saving isn't helping the problem. What they don't explore is why the lower brackets aren't actually saving money. Now my only logical explanation is that it is purely and simply because those people do not have money to save. It doesn't matter how much you incentivize it, they don't have a spare penny to put into an ISA or a stocks and shares investment account. When you factor in the high cost of living, energy bills and all of the other costs, it's not surprising. It's hard enough paying for bills and everyday living, never mind finding extra cash to put into an ISA every month. So in conclusion, the think tank are proposing to help those on low and middle incomes by incentivizing saving, when in fact all they're going to do is punish those who try and save and spend a lifetime saving really, really hard. They're effectively attacking the wrong people. They should be going after the super, super wealthy. And when you break it down, 100K isn't a big amount in the grand scheme of things. Don't get me wrong, it's a life-changing amount of money, but what we're talking about here is the wrong scale of economy. It would be a scheme that is very hard to manage, hard to tax, and effectively decentivizes saving by punishing those who save too much, which kind of goes against the fact that the UK is one of the lowest in the G7 for savings. And as we've already seen, adding incentives for the lowest income earners isn't really going to help. They need something else because they purely do not have enough money to save with. If you enjoyed this video, then check out this one here, which explores why it's so hard for first-time buyers to buy a house right now.